Russian researchers in the 1940s get five people awake in a top secret base for 15 days using an experimental gas-based stimulant. Because the gas was toxic in high concentrations, they were kept in a sealed environment where oxygen intake was carefully monitored. This was done before closed circuit cameras, so they had only microphones and a few small five inch thick glass windows. The chamber was stocked with books, cots to sleep on, but no bedding, running water, a toilet, and enough dried food to last all five over a month. The test subjects were political prisoners, deemed enemies of the state during the war. For the first five days, everything was fine. The subjects hardly complained having been promised falsely that they would be freed if they submitted to the test and did not sleep for 720 hours. 30 days. Their conversations and activity were monitored, and it was noted that they continued to talk about increasingly traumatic events in their past. After being awake for 96 hours, the conversations began to take a strange macabre turn, but other than the subject matter being spoken of, nothing was noteworthy. After 120 hours, they started to complain about the circumstances and events that led them to where they were, and started to demonstrate severe paranoia. They stopped talking to each other, and began alternately whispering to the microphones and the one-way mirrored windows. Oddly, they all seemed to think they could win the trust of the experimenters by turning on their comrades. A note was made, and the frequency, intensity, and duration of these attempts were logged to see if they would increase over time, and possibly with the amount of stimulant gas released into the chamber. After nine days, 216 hours awake, the first of them started screaming. He ran the length of the chamber repeatedly yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight. After that, he continued attempting to scream, but was only able to produce occasional squeaks as he sat and rocked in the corner. The researchers reasoned that he had physically torn his vocal cords from screaming. However, even stranger than this event was how the other captives reacted to it, or rather, didn't react. They continued whispering to the microphones, which was what they were doing almost exclusively at this point. That is, until the second of the captives started to scream. The three non-screaming captives calmly walked over to the bookshelf and started tearing them apart. Then, using a combination of toilet water and fecal matter, they began pasting the pages to the windows, blocking the scientist's view. Once all the windows were covered, the screaming stopped. So did the whisperings to the microphones. After three more days passed, the researchers started checking the microphones hourly to make sure they were working. Everything on their end looked good. At one point, they had a soldier tap the door one time. The microphones inside picked up the sound. The oxygen consumption in the chamber indicated that all five must still be alive. In fact, it was the amount of oxygen five people would consume at a very heavy level of strenuous exercise. On the morning of the 14th day, the researchers did something they said they would not do to get the attention from the captives. They used the intercom inside the chamber, hoping to provoke any response from the captives they were afraid were either dead or unconscious. They announced, We are opening the chamber to test the microphones. Step away from the door and lie flat on the floor or you will be shot. Compliance will earn one of you your immediate freedom. To their surprise, they heard a single phrase in a calm voice respond. We no longer want to be freed. Debate broke out among the researchers and the military personnel involved in the research. Unable to provoke any more response using the intercom, it was finally decided to open the chamber at midnight on the 15th day. The chamber was flushed of the stimulant gas and filled with fresh air, and immediately voices from the microphones began to object. Three different voices began begging as if pleading for the life of loved ones to turn the gas back on. The chamber was open and soldiers were sent in to retrieve the test subjects. They began to scream louder than ever, and so did the soldiers when they saw what was inside. Four of the five test subjects were still alive. Although no one could rightly call the state they were in, life. The food rations past day five were left untouched. There were chunks of meat from the dead test subjects' thighs and chests stuffed into the drain in the center of the chamber, allowing four inches of water and blood to accumulate on the floor. All four surviving test subjects had large portions of their muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. 
the destruction of flesh and exposed bone on their fingertips indicated that the wounds were inflicted by hand, not with teeth, as researchers initially thought. Closer examination of the position and angles of the wounds indicated that most, if not all of them, were self-inflicted. Some abdominal organs below the ribcage of all four test subjects had been removed, while the heart, lungs, and diaphragm remained in place. The skin and much of the muscles attached to the ribs had been ripped off, exposing the lungs through the ribcage. All the blood vessels and organs remained intact. They had just been taken out and laid on the floor, fanning out around the eviscerated but still living bodies of the subjects. The digestive tract of all four could be seen working, digesting food. It quickly became apparent that what they were digesting was their own flesh, that they had ripped off and eaten over the course of the days. Because of the clearances necessary for this experiment, nearly every Russian soldier was a Spetsnaz operative. But still, many refused to return to the chamber to remove the test subjects. The test subjects continued to scream to be left in the chamber, and alternately begged and demanded the gas be turned back on. To everyone's surprise, the test subjects put up a fierce fight in the process of being removed from the chamber. One of the Russian soldiers died from having his throat ripped out. Another was gravely injured by having a portion of his femur ripped off, causing uncontrollable bleeding. Another five of the soldiers lost their lives, if you count the ones that ended their own lives in the weeks following the incident. In the struggle, one of the four living subjects had his spleen ruptured, and he bled out almost immediately. The medical researchers attempted to sedate him, but were unable to. He was injected with more than ten times the normal dose of a morphine derivative, and still fought like a cornered animal breaking the ribs and arm of one doctor. His heart was seen beating for a full two minutes after he'd bled out to the point there was more air in his vascular system than blood. Even after it stopped, he continued to scream and flail for another three minutes, struggling to attack anyone in reach and just repeating the word, more, over and over, weaker and weaker, until he finally fell silent. The surviving three test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to a medical facility. The two with intact vocal cords continuously begging for the gas, demanding to be kept awake. The most injured of the three was taken to the only surgical operating room in the facility. In the process of preparing the subject to have his organs placed back within his body, it was found he was effectively immune to the sedative they had given him to prepare him for surgery. He fought furiously against his restraints when the anesthetic gas was brought out to put him under. He managed to tear most of the way through a 4 inch wide leather strap on one wrist even through the weight of a 200-pound soldier holding that wrist as well. It only took a little more anesthetic gas than normal to put him under, and the instant his eyelids fluttered and closed, his heart stopped. In the autopsy of the test subject that had died on the table, it was found that his blood had tripled the normal oxygen level. His muscles that were still attached to his skeleton were badly torn, and he had broken nine bones in his struggle to not be subdued. Most of them were from the force of his own muscles. The second survivor had been the first of the group of five to start screaming. His vocal cords were destroyed. He was unable to beg or object to surgery, and he only reacted by shaking his head violently in disapproval when the anesthetic gas was brought near him. He shook his head yes when someone suggested, reluctantly, that they try the surgery without the anesthetic, and he did not react for the entire six-hour procedure of replacing his missing organs and attempting to cover them with what remained of his skin. The surgeon presiding stated repeatedly that it should be medically impossible for the patient to still be alive. One terrified nurse assisting the surgery stated that she had seen the patient's mouth curl into a smile several times whenever his eyes met hers. When the surgery ended, the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly, attempting to talk while struggling. Assuming this must be something of drastic importance, the surgeon sent for a pen and pad so the patient could write his message. When he got it, the message was simple. Keep cutting. The other two test subjects were given the same surgery, both without anesthetic as well. They had to be injected with the paralytic for the duration of the operation. It was necessary to stop the patients from laughing. The surgeon found it impossible to perform the operation while the patients laughed maniacally. Once paralyzed, the subjects could only follow the attending researchers with their eyes. The paralytic cleared their system in an abnormally short amount of time, and they were soon trying to escape their bonds. The moment they could speak, they were again asking for the stimulant gas. The researchers tried asking why they had injured themselves, 
why they ripped out their own guts, and why they wanted to be given the gas again. Only one reply was given. I must remain awake. All three subjects' restraints were reinforced, and they were placed back in the chamber, awaiting determination as to what's to be done with them. The researchers, facing the wrath of their military benefactors for having failed the stated goals of their project, considered euthanizing the surviving subjects. The commanding officer, an ex-KGB, instead saw potential and wanted to see what would happen if they were put back on the gas. The researchers strongly objected, but were overruled. In preparation for being sealed in the chamber again, the subjects were connected to an EEG monitor and had their restraints padded for long-term confinement. To everyone's surprise, all three stopped struggling the moment it was let slip that they were going back on the gas. It was obvious at this point all three were putting up a great struggle to stay awake. One subject that could speak was humming loudly and continuously. The mute subject was straining his legs against the leather bonds with all his might. First left, then right, then left again, for something to focus on. The remaining subject was holding his head off his pillow and blinking rapidly. Having been the first to be wired for EEG, most of the researchers were monitoring his brain waves in surprise. They were normal most of the time, but sometimes would flatline inexplicably. It looked as if he were repeatedly suffering brain death before returning to normal. As they focused on the paper scrolling out of the brainwave monitor, only one nurse saw his eyes slip shut at the same moment his head hit the pillow, then flatlined for the last time as his heart simultaneously stopped. The only remaining subject that could speak started screaming to be sealed in now. His brainwave showed the same flatlines as the one who just died from falling asleep. The commanding officer gave the order to seal the chamber immediately, with both subjects inside, as well as three researchers. One of the three researchers immediately drew his gun and shot the commander point-blank between the eyes, then turned the gun on the mute subject and blew his brains out as well. He pointed his gun at the remaining subject, still restrained to the bed, as the remaining members of the medical research team fled the room. I won't be locked in here with these things. Not with you. What are you? He demanded. I must know. The subject smiled. Have you forgotten so easily? The subject asked. We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go into the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. The researcher paused, then aimed at the subject's heart and fired. The EEG flatlined as the subject weakly choked out. So, <coughs> nearly free. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, you should check out the Super Horror Show Creepypasta playlist for the best collection of creepypasta videos on YouTube. Or, if you're in the mood for some true scary stories, check out our True Encounter series. True Scary Stories, sent in by you.